Uh, good morning, Gardens. Good morning. Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus. It's good to see you. Glad that you are here. Jesus, through the power and presence of his Holy Spirit, calls us into worship, meets us in worship this day, and invites us to experience the Lord's presence through the word proclaimed, through prayer, as we sing, as we pray together. So would you join me in the call to worship, which you'll find both on the screens and also printed in your bulletin. The Lord be with you. The Lord God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is here in our midst. Amen. Amen. And that is taken from the book of Acts, part of um, the scripture and sermon series that we're, we've, been, we've been going through over the last few weeks. And this comes from the particular passage of scripture in Acts uh, 20, I think is what we're talking about today, um, where Paul is uh, talking, kind of concluding his third missionary journey. But more on that later. If you are new or a guest or a visitor, we're glad that you're here at Gardens. I pray that you'd experience the presence of Christ in this place. Pray that you would experience a sense of Christ's friendship and fellowship through and in this congregation. And I pray that you would experience God's call in your life as you would be drawn more deeply into your relationship with God and called into the service of our Lord and King Jesus. Some announcements to share with you all this morning. Um, the first is that uh, perhaps you've heard a week from Tuesday there's an election. Maybe you've heard. This is a polling place. Um, and we're anticipating it being crazy. It feels like a fair anticipation, right? A fair assumption. Um, so we're going to close the church that day. Um, we're going to close the office. We're going to send the staff home. Staff is going to be working from home that day. Um, there are a couple of things that were on the calendar that we're asking be either postponed or rescheduled. Music and worship um, and a Presbyterian women's meeting. Um, those, we're, we're just going to open up our facilities for the county and the election officials and all those kind of things. And so we think that that's going to be the best way that we can be good stewards of our space and of our time and respect our staff and some of the needs that they have in the midst of that craziness. So election day, church offices will be closed. Also wanted to let you know that today is the last day that you can sign up for a ministry architect uh, listening groups that will be occurring this Friday and Saturday. Again, as you recall, Ministry Architects are a national cons ministry consulting organization. They'll be here next weekend conducting a church assessment, helping us to answer these two questions. Where are we in our work, in our relationship, our mission with God as a congregation? And where is God calling us to go? How do we bridge that gap? Sunday after worship, that's next Sunday after worship, um, we're going to have a congregation fellowship meal, and immediately following that meal, anyone who wants to stay, uh, we invite you to come back into this room, this sanctuary, and hear from ministry architects, hear from um, those consultants who will be here with us, and they'll share their findings, they'll share their report with us, and it's going to be an exciting weekend for us, really, because this weekend, this first weekend in November, next weekend, marks for us kind of the beginning of what is next, an opportunity for us to hear what God is doing in our midst, to begin to hear the ways that we feel like God, the Spirit of God, is leading us. And so once we have a chance to hear from our ministry partners, from ministry architects, likely we'll have a couple of weeks, a couple, maybe a month or two of our leadership of the congregation will kind of digest the report, begin to work on creating some mission plans out of that. And by the first of next year, we'll be able to come to the congregation with some vision plan and some mission for the future in terms of what God is calling us to be and to do. So it's exciting times here at Gardens. And the final announcement that I have for y'all is, again, this Thanksgiving, we are continuing to build and to grow and to value our partnership with the REACH Shelter. And so we will continue to provide Thanksgiving dinners for the families at the REACH Shelter, which is Palm Beach County's only emergency transitional housing shelter for homeless homeless families. And um, you can sign up. There's baskets to, uh, to donate, financial, financial donations uh, to help with that mission project that we have. Those are all the announcements that I have, so I would invite you on out to stand and to greet one another and welcome each other to worship. Our scripture lesson for this morning is Acts 
chapter 20, verses 13 through 24. Again, just in terms of context, we've been working through the book of Acts over the last five or six weeks, maybe longer. Can't really remember. This is part of uh, Paul's third missionary journey. So the latter half of Acts is, the first half of Acts is kind of divided by the, really the ministry of the apostle Peter and the church in Jerusalem. The second half of Acts is organized in terms of the Apostle Paul and Paul's ongoing mission around that Mediterranean basin to proclaim the gospel of Jesus in those places. And so Paul's work, the book of Acts, really uh, is organized around Paul's three main missionary trips. So we're at the third one. Um, and so today we're going to talk a little bit about the specifics and the geography of it, but we're actually going to start wrapping up some of those loose ends, tying together a nice little bow, some of the things that we've been talking about over the last couple of weeks. Acts 20, 13 through 24 comes, I would say, five-sevenths of the way through his third missionary journey. So towards the end, but not at the very end, okay? Um, and you'll see what's happening is Paul is, is going to say, he's saying goodbye to the folks, the church at Ephesus, where he spent the better part of a year and a half in ministry there. And they're concerned about him because what Paul has told them is that he wants to go on and continue his journey and end up in Jerusalem. But what the church in Ephesus is hearing and what they're concerned about is that if Paul goes to Jerusalem, he's going to be arrested because he's been kicking up enough muck here in the Mediterranean basin over the last seven years that the powers that be, both within the Roman Empire and within the established Jewish synagogue, have really frankly had enough of Paul. So with that context, hear now the word of the Lord. This is Paul's farewell to the Ephesian leaders. We went on to the ship and sailed for Assos, where we intended to take Paul on board. Paul had arranged this, since he intended to make his way there by land. When he met us at Assos, we took him aboard and went on to Mytilene. And the next day we sailed from there and arrived at the opposite, Chios. On that day after, we sailed to Samos, and on the following day we came to Miletus, Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he wouldn't need to spend too much time in the province of Asia. He was hurrying to reach Jerusalem, if possible, by Pentecost Day. From Miletus, he sent a message to Ephesus calling for the church elders to meet him. And when they arrived, he said to them, You know how I lived among you the whole time I was with you, beginning with the first day I arrived in the province of Asia. And I served the Lord with great humility and with tears in the midst of trials that came upon me because of the Jews' schemes. You know I held back nothing that would be helpful so that I could proclaim to you and teach you both publicly and privately in your homes. You know I have testified to both Jews and Greeks that they must change their hearts and lives and turn to God and have faith in our Lord Jesus. Now, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem. I don't know what will happen to me there. What I do know is that the Holy Spirit testifies to me from city to city that prisons and troubles await me. But nothing, not even my life, is more important than my completing my mission. This is nothing other than the ministry I receive from the Lord Jesus to, testi to testify about the good news of God's grace. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Jesus, we give you thanks for your presence in this place, and we pray that as we open your scriptures, as we hear your word read, as we reflect upon it, that Jesus, you would be present, that you would be speaking to our hearts, speaking to us. Speak to us as your church, as we read this particular passage of scripture, as we read all of the book of Acts, through the lens of thinking about what it means for us as a congregation, thinking about what it means for us as we participate in your ministry and mission in this world. Jesus, I pray that you would have mercy on me, a sinner. In your name we pray. Amen. So Paul's third missionary journey. I think we've got a map of it up here. You can kind of see how he's cruising around the Mediterranean Sea, and you'll note that, especially if you've been with us last week, maybe even the week before that, that this map is really pretty much unchanged. 
right? At this point, Paul is kind of here in this third missionary journey. He's going to hit a lot of the spots that he's already visited. He's going to do that to go build up the churches, to pour into the leaders that he's already established. Um, he's going to go do that to remind some of the churches about the ways of Jesus and the ways that they're called to live. They might have forgotten some of those things. And here in Paul's third missionary journey, it's recorded in the book of Acts from Acts 18, 23, verse, uh, chapter 18, verse 23, through chapter 21, verse 22. So that's what, three chapters, about three chapters of the book of Acts dedicated to Paul's third missionary journey. This takes, this journey takes four years. Last week we talked about his second missionary journey that took three years. So this one is four years with the majority of that time, more than 50% in Ephesus, which is right there by the number two. You'll see on the map there, right underneath the province of Asia. That's where he spends the bulk of his time here in the third missionary journey. And last week we talked about how on his second missionary journey, he traveled over 3,000 miles, which was essentially roughly the equivalent of traveling from Palm Beach Gardens to Seattle, Washington. Today, we're talking about the third missionary journey, which Paul traveled 2,515 miles. So a little bit less. He's getting, he's slowing down in his old age. Paul is here. Um, so what do you think? How far would 2,515 miles get you? Do y'all remember some of the cues and clues from last week? Yeah, right. There was San Diego, Los Angeles, Southern California. He spent enough, Paul spent enough time in the Pacific Northwest, right? He spent enough time in that rain and the gloom. He's going to Southern California this time. Um, metaphorically speaking, of course. Right, so essentially the difference, the, the, the distance between Palm Beach Gardens and San Diego He's doing this over land. He's doing this over sea. And a couple of different things that we notice here in Paul's third missionary journey that differentiate it from his first two. So the, this is the first time that Paul is sailing out of Antioch. Again, there on the far right of your screen where that number one is, Syrian Antioch. Remember, that's his home church. That's the church that commissioned him to be this missionary church planter. This is the first journey that Paul is going to embark upon flying solo. He has no wingman in this journey. The first journey, he brought along Barnabas, right? He brought along John Mark. And then they had that little difference of opinion at the beginning of the second journey. So then Paul brought Silas on board. Well, this is significant because this is the first journey that we see Paul taking without a wingman, which is curious, especially in relation to some of the things that we're about to talk about. So hold on to that thought. It is actually fairly significant. And the second thing is this is Paul... You don't know if he knows it at the time, but this is his, his adios, God bless you, loved being with you to his home church in Syrian Antioch. He will not return to this church. He will not return to this city ever again. His journey on the third missionary journey will conclude with him imprisoned in Jerusalem. And he'll spend some time in Jerusalem. He'll spend some time being tried there by both the Jewish and the Roman leaders of Jerusalem. And Paul's third missionary journey actually ends with what's sometimes called Paul's fourth mission. That's hard to say. Fourth missionary journey, which is Paul's um, trip to Rome. And so, it which actually is done under arrest. So what happens in, at the end of this third missionary journey is Paul's arrested in Jerusalem. Um, he makes, he appeals to the Roman authorities. He's a Roman citizen, so he appeals to the Roman authorities in the city of Rome. And what happens is he's essentially a prisoner who's then transported from Jerusalem to Rome, which actually you don't even see on this map, but you'll see it on the next one. Just off to the left there on the other side of where Greece is. And um, where Paul will spend the end of his days under house arrest in Rome, writing letters, receiving visitors, uh, until his death in which he is martyred in Rome um, during the year 64, maybe? Somewhere thereabouts. So we're talking about this for the, his fourth missionary journey is from the year 54 to 58. 
So again, those four years are going to cover that. Um, and so here's the deal. I'm not going to, we're not going to go through this journey like we've done the last two. Just, you get it. I want you to get a sense of it, a sense of the scope. You'll see who starts at Antioch there at one, travels across by land, across modern day Turkey, right? Through Syria, modern day Turkey, a reason that we see in the news a lot these days. And for not good reasons. Uh, moves over into Ephesus, spends the bulk of his time in Ephesus, which is that number two. Then he goes north to Troas, where you th- see three. Sails across the Aegean, there into the region of Philippi, the Macedonia region there. He's in the Neapolis. Sails down to Corinth at the bottom there of the Greek peninsula. Up again to Philippi. Then he flies, uh, flies, <laughs> yeah. hops on a flight, 777. It's the Dreamliner, the new Boeing. It's wonderful pleasure to, to experience that, right? Across the Aegean Sea to Assos, which is where we picked up the reading from this morning, right? Where he's in Assos and he's listening to the Spirit. And this time the Spirit's going, okay, it's time to start moving to Jerusalem. Paul's real, and he's recognizing that that movement towards Jerusalem is going to involve his own imprisonment and those things. He kind of buzzes down through Ephesus there in between seven and eight, where he meets with the, the Ephesian leaders. And the church goes, don't do it. Nothing good can come of this. And Paul goes, I got no choice, right? This is what the Spirit of God has called me to do. This is my calling. This is my destiny. So from there to Miletus, sails down to Patara, then all the way down across. And then in the scriptures, it says, we bypass Cyprus, you know, uh, and his buddy Barnabas, who's there doing ministry. Hits Tyre, down to Ptolemus, and then into Caesarea, and then Jerusalem, which is there. You actually can't see it on that. I can't see it on mine. Can you see it on yours? You can't really see there. But that 14 is where Jerusalem is and where Paul ends in imprisonment. So that's the general sense of it. And you see the scope. You'll notice that really for the most part, he's not doing a lot of expansion of the, of the geographic footprint where he's planting the gospel, where he's planting churches, and when he's establishing the outposts. And if we look at the next slide here that Linda has for us, this gives you a sense of what he has been all about over these last, what, we said four, three, two, seven or eight years, right? Maybe nine years, depending on how you do math, which may be better than me. So the, 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 what you see there in white was, is his first missionary journey. What you see in yellow uh, which you see in blue is his, uh, yellow is his second, and blue is his third missionary journey. So you can kind of see what happens as it begins to expand geographically. And now finally, what's going to happen, and this is what I hinted at, when he's arrested in Jerusalem, this begins his kind of fourth, his final, sometimes it's referred to as his Roman missionary journey. That involves sailing across the Mediterranean Sea. It involves being shipwrecked, and then up ultimately into to modern day Italy, into Rome, where he'll spend his time there. So you get a sense, and so just kind of, you, you can see and you get a sense of the way that the gospel is, is geographically and is physically, literally expanding. The church is growing. The church before Paul, it wasn't in any of those places. After Paul, it's in all these places. Again, why is this significant for us as a congregation? Because as the church of Jesus Christ, the question that we always need to have before us, the question that we are always being asked by the Spirit of God is, how are we as a congregation called to expand the kingdom of God? How are we as disciples called to expand the kingdom of God? And how are we as a collective community of disciples called to expand the kingdom, called to plant the gospel, called to see places where there is no hope, where there is no restoration, where that proclamation of God's mercy and justice and grace and forgiveness in Jesus is not already there? How can we find those places those relationships, those neighborhoods, those corners of the world, and how is God calling us as a church and as a congregation to expand the kingdom? And that's actually, frankly, what next weekend is all about. That's what the whole purpose we're bringing ministry architects here. To wrestle with that question, to figure out what the Spirit of God is doing, to be bold enough like Paul to ask the Holy Spirit to guide us, And then to be crazy enough like Paul to pursue whatever it is that God is calling us to do as a congregation despite the cost, 
despite the seeming sacrifice, despite the impossibility of it. That is who we are, and that is why we are reading the book of Acts. That is why we are paying attention to all of what Paul has been doing here. So here's the deal. Tied up a few loose ends. And I said we would do this when we first started talking about Paul's first missionary journey. If you were to look at Paul's ministry across all three of his journeys across that Mediterranean basin, if you were to distill some of the things that were consistently evident across those nine years of Paul's ministry, things that we might be able to think about applying to our, our life as a congregation and as a church, I think there's six things that we need to be mindful of. The first, and we've talked about that in a lot last week, but is Paul had this sense, he, he sought direct guidance from the Holy Spirit. I mean, Paul would literally, in prayer, ask, what road do you want me to take, Holy Spirit? And then he would come to a fork in a road and he would sense that the Spirit was leading him this way and not that way. So he would go that way, the way that he sent the Spirit. So there's this guidance. He was wired into that. He believed, and this might be the, the most challenging thing for us as a congregation, but Paul believed that the Holy Spirit would actually speak into some of the specifics of his life and ministry. Do we believe that the Holy Spirit of God cares enough about us as a congregation to speak into the specifics of our life? in our ministry. Do we trust that? Because then what Paul did is, not only did Paul seek that guidance, but then Paul trusted that. The Spirit has spoken, so I trust that it's right. I trust that it's good. And most importantly, I trust that because the Spirit has called me and led me in this way, I trust that the Spirit will give me everything that I need to accomplish this. The second thing that Paul did every stop of the way, everywhere you see a kind of a, a color line on that screen right there in front of you on that map, is that Paul proclaimed the word. Paul proclaimed the gospel of Jesus. What is the gospel of Jesus? In Christ, God has reconciled and redeemed the world. In Christ, God has taken away sin. In Christ, God has offered wholeness, not just to individual souls, but to this cosmic world that is crazy and broken in so many ways. Christ has come to heal that, to provide and to write an alternative where good is done, where things are done according to God's will and as God wants and desires. The gospel involves grace and mercy and forgiveness, and it involves justice and wholeness and rightness in the world. And Paul proclaimed that every step of the way. And as a congregation, that is what we are called to proclaim in our corporate life together and in our own lives as individual disciples in our schools, in our neighborhoods, with our friends, with our family. And the third thing that we see Paul doing, and this actually, I hinted at this when I first talked about how Paul journeys away from Syrian Antioch here in this third missionary journey by himself for the first time. One of the things that you see Paul doing every step of the way is he utilizes team ministry. He's never a lone wolf, ever. So first he had... Barnabas. Then he had Saul. But now you're going, but wait a second, Kyle. You just made this big deal. You said he's leaving Syrian Antioch by himself. Do you know why he's leaving Syrian Antioch by himself? Where's he going? He's going to churches and cities that he's already been to, right? That he's already planted. That he's already developed leaders in. So right now, Paul, he's still committed to team ministry. He's still committed to this partnership in the gospel. But now, he doesn't need to bring a dance partner to the dance because he's got a whole dance full of partners everywhere. And so he knows that these kind of disciples of his, these folks that he's been mentoring, not only in the faith of Jesus, but in leadership, now are ready to step up. And so now they're not just going to be kind of disciples and leaders within their communities. They're going to kind of join with Paul in this apostolic work of proclaiming the gospel. And this ties into kind of the fourth thing. That's, so, so what does that mean for us at Gardens? Teams. We can't be lone wolves. And if we ever find ourselves in a situation where things are dependent upon solely one person, then we aren't living into what God has called us to be as a community called to be in ministry and service together. 
And this ties in, so what we're going to talk about next ties into that. Paul, everywhere he goes, establishes, this is a fancy word. Ready for a fancy word? Are right, you ready? Yeah, here it is. Fancy word. Indigenous, indigenous leadership. Isn't that a fun word? What does that fancy word mean? It just means leaders who live there. <laughs> right, so what Paul is not doing is he's not taking a whole parcel of people from Syrian Antioch with him and just kind of depositing them in these local communities. He's not taking a whole parcel of people from Syrian Antioch and saying, okay, you 12, you are now going to live in Athens, and I want you to be the leadership of this church. Everywhere he's going, he's interacting with the folks who live in those communities, proclaiming the gospel to those folks, and building them up in their leadership capacities. Paul didn't even stick around in those churches. Paul doesn't even say, I want to stay and be your leader. Paul goes, y'all be leaders. I'm out. I don't want that responsibility. That is your responsibility now, right? So what does that mean for us as a congregation? It means that we, within our congregation, need to be developing leaders from within this congregation and within our communities, within our neighborhoods, friends and families, everywhere that we go are places and people who can be called and drawn into the leadership and the ministry of this church. Because what's important and what's significant about the indigenous leadership in a place like Corinth or in the region of Ephesus, they know people, right? Probably more people, that, that, this, is, this might be just a complete and total stretch on my part, but I would suspect that the people who actually live in Corinth know more Corinthians than people from Syrian Antioch, right? So Paul, it's, 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 it's more effective if you take people who live in Corinth and you develop them as leadership rather than implanting leaders on top of that. So it makes a lot of sense from a missional perspective. The, the fifth and almost last thing that we can look at what Paul is doing here in his missionary journeys is he is working on what's called contextualized ministry. It means he lets his context define the scope of his mission and his ministry and his work. What does that mean? It means that every city he does something different based on what is the city has come to expect. Right? To the point where Paul was, goes to Athens. And he goes to this, um, it's a pagan temple, it's on Mars Hill. And the Athenians, they, they, were, they were very religious people. They had this temple, they, and it was this temple that had different um, kind of altars to all the different gods. And then there was this altar over here, and it was blank, and they said, and there was a sign on it that said, this is the altar that we've built to worship the unknown god. And so Paul, recognizing this kind of spirituality within the Athenians, then begins to say, hey, y'all are, are God-worshiping folks. I mean, I get that. You get that. You know that. Look at all these gods that you worship. Hey, I noticed that there's an altar right here. This, it says to an unknown God. Guess what, y'all? I know who that God is. He's the Lord Jesus. And then let me tell you about what else Jesus can do, right? So depending on where he is, it shapes his ministry. Depends if he was talking to some of the folks who were Jewish in the community, he would teach at the synagogue. If he was talking to the Gentiles, it would be more in the community. It would depend on what he was doing. Everything was contextualized. And here's the final thing, and actually, full confession. I just thought of this this morning. So I think it's true, actually. I think this might actually be the reason, the one reason that God wants us to focus on this scripture today. And that is, Paul pursued to his death a God-planted dream in his soul. Paul's dream was to go to Rome. Actually, it was to go to Rome and to Spain. So he got kind of there. Never made it to Spain. That was Paul's dream when he talked about going to the ends of the earth. It was all across this Mediterranean basin, but he had his silver tuna. He felt like God put this call, this dream in his heart to get to Rome, to get to the epicenter of this Roman civilized world and proclaim the gospel and plant a church. That was his dream. That was his vision. He felt like that was the one thing God called him to do. He did it. It cost him his life. But he so believed that that was what God was calling him to do. 
that he would stop at nothing to do it, right? Here's what the scriptures say. Nothing, not even my life, is more important than completing my mission. This is nothing other than the ministry I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify about the good news of God's grace. Friends, brothers, and sisters in Jesus, we have a God dream in this church. We have it. I don't know what it is yet. We'll uncover it. And that's going to be our next big task as a congregation. To uncover what the God dream is. To uncover what God has planted in our hearts as a congregation. And then we will pursue it. Because that is who we are called to be. It probably won't kill us because we're fortunate to live in our own context right now. But we will be faithful to whatever it is that God calls us to do so that we can glorify Jesus and be about the work of seeing that kingdom of God grow and be planted here in our world. And again, shameless plug. That's what's happening next weekend. That's why Ministry Architects is coming. To help us figure out that God-planted dream in our life and figure out how we can get there. Let's pray together. Almighty and merciful God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are good and you plant God dreams in our lives just like you plant them in Paul's. And so I pray, Jesus, that you would lead us in season, this season, this week of discernment. I pray that you would lead us in this time of investigation, of holy and spiritual investigation. Jesus, I pray that just as Paul had a dream that you planted in his heart, that we as a congregation would have a dream that you plant in our hearts. And that we, like Paul, and with his dedication to you and faithfulness to you, we would be like him in seeking to do nothing but to be faithful to you, nothing but achieving that dream and that vision that you have called us to. And so we pray for next weekend. We pray for next Friday, and we pray for Saturday, and we pray for Sunday. We pray for our time with our partners and our friends from Ministry Architects. Pray for Missy and for Jen, the two consultants who will be with us. We pray, God, that you would give them wisdom. We pray that you would give us as a congregation, you would give us clarity, clarity of thought and clarity of dreams and of vision so that, Jesus, your Spirit would be leading us into your good future, that your Spirit would be leading us into the places that you are calling us to proclaim the hope that we have in you, Lord Jesus. Pray, God, these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.